Hey everybody, uh, this is your uh, professor Aaron Rosari uh, coming to you live from my office, which you can see is very neat and tidy. There's no random partially open boxes or, you know, pictures of my kids back there or things like that. No, it's just all down to business here. Okay, this week uh, we have been discussing uh, one of my favorite ethical theories. I think it has a lot of explanatory power. And let me just pop up a slide real quick. It's the only slide you'll see in this presentation. All right. So this is just a, a book cover. This is uh, What We Owe to Each Other by T.M. Scanlon, who's a longtime Harvard professor, recently retired. And as the title implies, uh, it's a theory of moral obligation or moral duties that we have toward one another, okay? So just keep that in mind as we go along. Uh, I'm not going to systematically go through all the reading questions in this, this video. I really just want to hone in and explain Scanlon's theory of moral wrongness. I think it makes a lot of sense. It's, um, as you'll see, it it matches very well with what we are actually doing uh, when we make moral arguments, uh, when we hold each other morally accountable, uh, when we engage in moral criticism. It does an excellent job of capturing these very practical features uh, of our moral landscape, okay? Uh, my methodology is going to be pretty simple this time around. I'm basically going to highlight a few quotes from the essay you read that largely correspond to that last reading question, question four. And we'll just use the quote from J.S. Mill on moral wrongness, and then the quote from Scanlon that kind of maps out and defines his own view of moral wrongness. That'll be the main touch points for conversation in this video. And then I'll also give a couple of the illustrations uh, from that lecture as well. And then we'll call it a day as far as this video is concerned. Uh, having written this week's lecture, I've kind of said a lot of things I wanted to say and wanted to highlight. Uh, here, I just really want to zoom in on Scanlon's account of moral wrongness. And then I'll also post a discussion board where you can think through a moral issue uh, the way Scanlon would, or like using the apparatus he gives us, and that'll give you a deeper feel for the theory and how it works, okay? All right, so let me stop this share. And um, all right, I'll go to a different share. So I'm just gonna pop up uh, again, Scanlon's own article. Oh, no, sorry. The article I wrote on, on Scanlon's theory. And we're going to jump ahead. And you're going to get a second uh, set of reading questions on Scanlon, kind of covering just the last four pages uh, of this written lecture. And uh, that'll be good. I'll build in some redundancy so you can uh, interact with a couple of the ideas more than once. And um, yeah, so by the end of next week, certainly you'll have a really good uh, good handle on what's happening. All right, so we're going to start off, and this our again our presentation is going to track this fourth question. Uh, we're in the section entitled "Wrong Actions Are the Justifiably Punished Ones," and. Um, Right, so let's jump in. Here's a quote from a very famous uh, philosopher from history, uh, writing in the 1700s or 18th century. Actually, he was writing in the 1800s as well, uh, J.S. Mill. Um, or let me rephrase that. Uh, he was writing pretty much exclusively in the 1800s. Okay. Here's the quote, and then we'll unpack it, and then we'll also, again, connect it to Scanlon's thoughts. We do not call anything wrong unless we mean to imply that a person ought to be punished in some way or other 
for doing it. If not by law, by the opinion of his or her or their fellow creatures, if not by opinion, by the reproaches of one's own conscience, it is a part of the very notion of duty in every one of its forms that a person may rightfully be compelled to fulfill it. There are other things which we wish people would, should do, which we like or admire them for doing, perhaps dislike or despise them for not doing, but yet admit they are not bound to do it. They don't have to do it. Uh, it is not a case of moral obligation. We do not blame them, that is. We do not think they are proper objects of punishment. So let's take a second and break this down. Uh, Mill is talking about moral wrongness, and he's also talking about the notion of a moral duty or obligation. How are these two terms connected? And this generalizes beyond Mill. Uh, it's fair to say, uh, may maybe you can imagine some quirky exception to this, but if I do something wrong towards you, or if I wrong you, uh, I'm also simultaneously, or another way of capturing that is saying, I'm violating a duty I have toward you, okay? So, Mill is kind of simultaneously defining the notion of moral wrongness, and he's also defining what it means to have a moral obligation or duty towards someone. And he thinks the what's implied by this idea, it's wrong for me to, let's say, uh, steal your computer, or I have a duty not to steal your computer. Let's say I were to steal your computer. Well, I ought to be punished in some way or other for doing it. Uh, now, if I do something more minor than that, perhaps it's not a legal matter. Let's say I, um, I don't know, like I see you on campus. I'm in a grumpy mood, uh, having nothing to do with any of my students. I just feel grouchy that day. And you say hello to me and I'm kind of a jerk about it and kind of brush you off, kind of rude. Uh, you know, you wouldn't call the police or anything like that, uh, but you could punish me. Uh, the way Mill is using the term, uh, by your opinion of me. It would be fair for you to complain. It would be fair for you to, uh, or justifiable of you to tell others, ah, oh, you know, I just wasn't treated well by this person today. That wouldn't be, uh, you wouldn't be making anything up. Uh, be The idea is, it would be fair for you to take some sort of critical stance toward me. And in the case of more serious moral wrongs, it would be fair for you to defend yourself or as a society by placing people in prison or taking them to court. It's kind of a societal self-defense against the person. So Mill's point is this strikes at the very heart of the nature of moral wrongness. If someone does something morally wrong, we justifiably either oppose, criticize, or punish them. You know, we can kind of apply some force in the opposite direction. That's the idea. So Mill says this in a few ways. It is part of the very notion of duty in every one of its forms that a person may rightfully be compelled to fulfill it. Okay. So let's just go with common sense morality for a second. Uh, we all have, you know, a right, right to life. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it means others have duties or obligations. Again, we're going to use these synonymously uh, to not kill us. Um, so the notion of a human right or a moral right correlates well with the notion of a duty. I have a right to live if you have a duty not to kill me. I have a right to free speech. If you have a duty not to muzzle that speech, taking that a step further, what does it mean uh, to say I have a duty or you have a duty or we have a duty is that if we fail to perform an action such as 
refraining from from harming another person, refraining from theft, uh, then others are justified, especially those affected by the action are justified, again, in criticizing or opposing what we do. Okay. Now, much earlier in this reading, first section, we talked about um, the moral must or the moral should. One must be ethical on pains of blank. I think that was your second reading question. And the way Mill would fill that in is if we're not ethical, if we're not treating others justly or in a morally good way, uh, then we kind of deserve their pushback. We deserve this sort of criticism, punishment, et cetera. Okay, so that strikes at the essence of moral wrongness. Uh, now, just to clarify a little further, there are other things which we wish that people would do uh, or other things people do that we dislike, but we would never dream of... Uh, punishing them for either doing or not doing those things so you know people in my generation if we're going to make fun of a music band it's either going to be nickelback or creed so let's say i uh I drive by you and you're in your car and i'm in mine and i hear you listening to let's say nickelback uh i might be like ugh, that was gross why would anyone listen to nickelback uh but i wouldn't entertain the idea of um you know, arranging for you to be fined for such an offense or anything like that. Uh, so there are ways or uh, contexts in which we really don't like what each other does, uh, but it's not really a moral issue. It could be aesthetic, uh, it could be a matter of convenience or inconvenience, um, but not really a core moral issue of moral wrongness. Okay, so again... It's this notion an action is morally wrong. If a person may be rightfully compelled uh, to do the opposite or do what's morally right. And um, right, that also ties into our notion of a moral duty or obligation. We can, It's right for others to insist we, we do it or depending how you phrase it, not do it, uh, depending on what the action is. Okay. So duties, this is key, are essentially to others. Um, all right, now, I say a bunch of stuff about Mill. Yeah, don't worry about that. We haven't covered Mill yet. All right, now let's move on to Scanlon. Scanlon named his view contractualism. Okay, and what does the contractualist emphasize? Well, contractualism comes out of what is called the social contract tradition of ethical theorizing because it emphasizes that the moral principles that regulate our behavior are for the purpose of enabling us to live with other people on mutually acceptable grounds. Okay? So we get a lot of insight into the nature of morally right actions and morally wrong actions if we pay attention to what we're trying to accomplish when we employ moral principles make moral arguments uh, engage in moral criticism that sort of thing and what we're really trying to do is to kind of regulate our interactions with one another so that we can live on mutually acceptable terms okay this puts uh, Scanlon's view not only in the social contract tradition, but in a kind of rights-based conception of ethics. Uh, my rights are what you owe to me. Your rights are what I owe to you. And again, this is all embedded in a social setting where that's determined by the by what we can uh, justifiably demand from each other or oppose. Uh, again, geared toward not just making moral judgments for moral judgment's sake, geared toward finding mutually acceptable, harmonious, 
uh, living conditions where we can flourish. Okay. Okay. Now, according to Scanlon, what makes an action morally wrong? Well, lengthy quote. Let's break it down bit by bit. So let's read this, this first italicized part first. I italicize two out of three parts just so they kind of alternate and are easy to sort. All right, so when I ask myself what reason the fact that an action would be wrong provides me with not to do it, my answer is, is that such an action would be one I could not justify to others on grounds I could expect them to accept, okay? This is key. So the function of a moral justification of our actions is to establish to the people affected by those actions that those actions are reasonable or justifiable. Uh, so typically the goal is to show, look, in acting this way, I'm not causing you harm or I'm only taking my share. I'm not taking more than my share and being unjust or unfair. I'm not depriving you of goods you would otherwise have uh, for a bad reason. So again, we're justifying our actions to others when we engage in the moral defense of our actions. That's why merely pointing out that an action was in your own self-interest, that you gained a ton from it, uh, doesn't really provide a moral justification for an action. That kind of misses the point. And we'll see that uh, when we go into a couple examples in a minute. Okay, now, back to Scanlon. This leads me to describe the subject matter of judgments of right and wrong by saying they are judgments about what would be permitted by principles that could not be reasonably rejected by people who are moved to find principles for the general regulation of behavior that others similarly motivated could not reasonably reject. Uh, so this part of this quote is kind of a mouthful. Uh, so let me just break it down to a couple pieces. So we're making judgments of right and wrong. They're judgments about what would be permitted by principles that could not be reasonably rejected. Okay, so let's say I propose to you the following law I want to enact in Congress to govern our mutual interactions. And the law says something like, um, everyone who uh, uses uh, the groundwater in a certain area for livestock uh, will clean up uh, after the livestock and not let their waste contaminate the groundwater. Okay. Okay. Now, could that be reasonably rejected by anyone? Well, probably not. I mean, the, um, let's say you own a factory farm and let's say you have a couple thousand pigs and let's say at present, you're not really cleaning up well after the pigs. So people's drinking water and the nearby community is getting affected. Uh, so, you know, the citizens around you, they come to you and say, look, um, we're holding you accountable. We need you to clean up after those pigs. We can't even drink our own water anymore. Uh, even the pig farmer, the factory farmer of pigs, not like an ordinary family farm, uh, would kind of get your point. Like, oh, I see. I can't reasonably tell you, look, uh, I'm saving a lot of money by not cleaning up after my pigs. Sure, you would have to you have to go without suitable drinking water. Um, anyone who has retained any self awareness about how their actions are affecting others could not reasonably reject 
this demand that one kind of like clean up after their own livestock. Okay. So this is what, what Scanlon's point is. All right. So again, what are we doing when we reason morally? We're finding mutually acceptable living conditions. I have to take your interest into account. You have to take my interest into account. It's not reasonable for anyone in the pig farmer situation uh, to reject this idea that the pig farmer who's making a lot of money off these pigs and benefiting enormously from the farm has no obligation to clean up after the pigs. Um, even the pig farmer should see no one is really going to let them get away with that because uh, even the, if the pig farmer were in their shoes, they would also push back. Okay. Okay. So that's the idea there. Um, in particular, an act is wrong if and only if any principle that permitted it would be one that could not be reasonably rejected by people with the motivation just described. And that was people who were moved to find principles for the general regulation of behavior. So let's summarize this, right? Here's the idea. If we want to figure out the morally right thing to do and therefore the morally wrong thing to do, we have to adopt this perspective of we're finding mutually acceptable ways of living together, okay? If I'm affecting another person or they're affecting me in a way I could reasonably reject, and again, this is best spelled out by example. Think of the pig farmer example. They want to pollute the water to make money. and But no, it's my water. I got to drink it. So I'm going to push back. Um, so I have reasons to oppose that action. Therefore, the action's morally wrong. So a really quick summary would be something like, um, if other people are justified... <laughs> and opposing or criticizing or rejecting your action, and those people are concerned to live with you on mutually acceptable terms, uh, then your action is wrong, okay? And th this is kind of summarized here. The gist of Scanlon's view is that if one's action is morally wrong, this is because it gives other people who are affected by that action and who are interested in living with one on mutually acceptable grounds, a reason to oppose it, okay? When we offer a moral justification of our action to others, we are more or less communicating to them that we are not giving them the short end of the stick, or at least we are not doing so uh, without a good reason, okay? So... And this is just an insight into the nature of moral reasoning. It's a conceptual tool we use, which is geared towards solving a specific set of problems that revolve around the question of how are we to, how are we to live with each other. So moral questions are questions of how we're going to do that. Uh, the morally good actions, policy choices are the ones that are mutually acceptable. Uh, they tend to not be harmful, tend to promote flourishing, tend to be fair, uh, so on and so forth. Okay. All right. Now, here's an illustration. And the purpose of this illustration is just to capture that merely self-interested reasons for doing an action do not constitute a moral justification for that action. Again, moral justification is justification to others. All right, so here's an illustrative example. Imagine someone is in the process of breaking into your house to steal your valuables, iPhone, computer, etc. Let's call this person Sheila. Sheila may have many reasons for her actions. She might want to have more spending cash for the upcoming weekend. She might enjoy the rush of breaking and entering. Or she might even wish to put the money to good use by donating it to charity. But 
none of these actions are reasons that can justify her actions to you. So just picture you walk home, you see Sheila running off with your iPhone, computer, and other portable items. You're like, hey, cut that out. What are you doing? And she gives you these sorts of justifications. Oh, I want some extra money for the weekend. That'll really benefit me. Um, you might look at her funny. You might think she's actually a little bit sociopathic, lacking in empathy, not understanding that her actions only are, are not only about her, they affect you. And that, heck, this is your property. Uh, so she has no right to that property. She is wronging you which Scanlon makes sense by saying you justifiably can oppose and criticize her actions. The very nature of moral wrongness, it would be justifiable for you to push back on what she's doing and stop her. Okay. Um, so just to tie it together back with Mill, you would be reasonable in calling the police to arrest her and ensure the integrity of your home and belongings. This reasonable use, this justified use of criticism, opposition, or force to hold Sheila accountable is what gives moral rules their authority. So why is her action morally wrong? Well, not just because you don't like it. You actually have justifiable reasons for opposing it. Uh, you worked hard for your money. You bought that stuff. She can't just come in and take it for her own good. Uh, that gives you the short end of the stick in a way uh, that you can you can oppose. Okay, all right. Um, Richard Joyce has a very similar. He's another philosopher. Makes a very similar point. Um, when we morally condemn a criminal, we do not first ascertain the state of this person's desires. Were we to discover that the person's desires were well served by their crimes, we do not respond, oh well, I suppose you have, ought to have done it after all. So with Sheila, okay, she wanted more money for the weekend. So from that perspective, it made sense to take the stuff. Oh, okay, then you were right to take the stuff. Uh, we, we literally never do that, okay? Because again... She can justify the action to herself. She has reasons that make sense of the action from a very selfish perspective, but she can't justify the action to the victim of the action. That's what makes it morally wrong. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think this is uh, this is enough. All right, so what makes an obligation an obligation? Well, others can reasonably demand that you act in a certain way. Uh, next week, uh, we're going to go a little more into the nature of moral reasons. Uh, what it, and kind of like lay out a picture of what a moral argument looks like that's relevant to moral accountability. Uh, that's on the last four pages of this uh, of this writing. And um, so if you're leaving with a, a good understanding, the morally right actions are the ones that everybody affected can be on board with, that nobody can justifiably reject. Uh, then you've gotten to the heart of Scanlon's theory and you've done and you've done well. All right. So I'm gonna go set up a discussion board and assign it to you. Uh, that allows you to kind of take Scanlon's definition of moral wrongness and use it to explain why a specific action would be morally wrong. Okay, and if you can do that, you have the gist of the theory. All right, thanks for listening. I hope this was helpful to you. Email with any questions, uh, and I'll, figuratively speaking, see you next week.